Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A very significant word in the Torah is the word tabernacle. It speaks about God's place where he dwells in a unique way. I've mentioned that even though God is omnipresent, that is, he is located everywhere, but in a unique way, in a special way, in a way of revelation, God dwelt in that tabernacle in order that the people of Israel might worship him. And through worship, and here's what's so vital, that through a God-pleasing worship, that change might come. And I say this so frequently, but if we don't desire to change, and to change in a way that's pleasing to God, if we don't affirm his purposes and submit to those purposes, following his instruction, there'll be change in our life, but there will not be God-pleasing change. We need to make a decision now. We're coming towards the end of the book of Exodus. And we see that after Yitziat Mitzrayim, the coming forth out of Egypt, after that Passover experience, what do we have? We have Israel being challenged. But unfortunately, at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, when God wanted to bring about a change in their life, that they would know the fear of the Lord. That is God's priority. And they would not sin, but they would obey. Israel rejected that. And now they are given instructions on how they can approach God. Remember, it says in Exodus chapter 20 twice that the children of Israel stood at a distance. And the only way that they can reconnect with that intimacy with God and find that change is through worship. Again, I've said this at least a dozen times. Worship is a catalyst for change and godly change. So we need to ask ourselves, is this what I want? Is this what I'm passionate about? Or am I a misguided individual that have wrongly believed that by giving to the things of God, worshiping him, singing songs in his name, that this can manipulate him to doing what I want? That is a false idolatry. And I say false because it will not produce what you think it will. And it is indeed idolatry. So it's false and it's idolatrous. We want to walk in truth. And truth is being challenged so, so harshly today. And unfortunately, many, many individuals, spiritual leaders are compromising because they fear the things they should not rather than walking in that boldness, in that power, and loving the things that God loves. So let's begin Exodus chapter 39. The book of Exodus and chapter 39. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 32. Now, for the most part, what we're going to encounter, and this study will be reasonably brief, because we have a list. The last section of this 39th chapter, the vast majority of the verses that we're going to be reading is simply an inventory 
an inventory of the vessels that comprise the tabernacle, the courtyard, and that border that, that marked, that designated the courtyard. And again, allow me to once more restate something, and that is borders are very important. See, this is something that you should write down and realize that borders are important to God. And we want to keep within the borders that God has approved for us. We do not want to transgress. See, the word for transgression, pesha, is when we violate the border. And when we violate the border, what we're doing is moving away from the anointing, the empowering, the illuminating of the Holy Spirit. And we are moving into spiritual darkness, whereby we won't have insight to do, to understand the proper things. Let's begin. We read in verse 32. All the work of the tabernacle was completed. It was completed, and then we have another word for tabernacle. Now, the word tabernacle is a noun for the verb dwelling. It's a place that, that God dwells. It's also called here Ohel Moed, and this is the appointed tent. We usually translate it the tent of meeting. Because God has appointed that place to meet with us for the purpose of worship and, and make a note of this, for the benefits of worship. Now, one of the things that I've attempted to do throughout this, this second half of the book of Exodus is to give from time to time principles that, that reveal to us the benefits of proper worship, how proper worship impacts and change us and makes us into the people that God desires us to be, commands us to be. So all the work of the tabernacle was completed, the tent of meeting, the children of Israel, they did according to all now, this is a very important term. K, kol. K is according to, kol is all. K, kol, according to all. All which commanded the Lord Moses. Thus they did. Now, we're going to see something. I mentioned last week as we, we took an inventory and had a listing of these elements and some of the ways that they consisted and, and the purposes thereof. But we saw something. We saw several times in the midst of chapter 39 where it would say, and we could just go back to verse 1, the last phrase of verse 1 where it says, Ka'asher tziva Hashem et Moshe, just as the Lord commanded Moses. That phrase, sometimes there's some additional words added to it, but that phrase appears, hear this, in chapter 39, 10 times. 10 is the number of completion. And what he's saying is this, it is only when we respond to the Lord's commands, what he has instructed, what he has revealed, it's only when we respond then is God going to go to work this edifying influence to bring about completely the changes that he wants within us? So it's not by accident that 10 times we see that phrase. The children of Israel did according to all. All what commanded the Lord. The emphasis is on the commanding. The Lord commanded Moses. Thus they did. Verse 33. Now, in order to demonstrate their obedience, and here again, this is an important fact. The children of Israel just didn't obey, but they demonstrated their obedience. What does that mean? 
they had a testimony. They bore witness to their faithfulness. This is part of worship. When we come before God and draw close to him, testifying that we have obeyed, that we have done the work, the commandments that he has given to us. Verse 33. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses. And when it says the tabernacle, it's saying all those things that we, we've spoken about for the last four, five months. These things that we went through and reviewed over the last two weeks, all of these elements. Now, I'm not going to share what they are because in a moment we're going to go through a list of them. He's going to repeat them one final time, what the tabernacle consisted of. Now, when he says here, Mishkan, the tabernacle, he's talking about what I've already mentioned, that tent in the meeting, also the courtyard, and the borders, the fence that marked off, that set those borders for this place where the work of worship, and did you hear that term? The work of worship was, was done. So he speaks generally about the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and then the next thing he says here, and the tent. And the tent now is that inner structure. The tent that he's referring to here is the tent that consisted of the holy place and the most holy place. And we will be reminded, it'll state it again, that in between those two places that were the, the tent of meeting, that tabernacle, in that inner structure where most of the vessels were, and we'll mention this in a moment, there was that parochet, that veil of separation, that screen that separated the most holy place, the holy of holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, Meha Kodesh, the holy place. That's what he's going to tell us. Again, verse 33. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, that holy place and most holy place, and all of its vessels. And now he's going to say what vessels he's referring to. The, the claps or the hooks. Those things were hung upon these hooks, these hangings, these, these uh, uh, curtains, the planks that gave support, and the bars that also allowed them to have a greater stability. The pillars and the sockets, literally its pillars and its sockets that comprised of the tent, that inner structure. And not only did it have all of these things to, to give it a structure, but it also says, look now to verse 34, and the coverings. Now, we know, we have seen over and over how there was that, that turquoise, that unique blue, the, the techelet, also the argaman, that royal purple, and also tolat sheni, that, that scarlet or crimson. And then finally, the, the twisted, twisted linen. But, but over that, we saw that there was coverings. And that's the word that appears here in verse 34. And coverings, coverings of skin, skins of animal. Now, the first one we know, the ran skin that was dyed uh, red, so it says. And the coverings of Ram skins dyed red, and the coverings of skins of, and it's a word, if we look at it, tachashin. But in actuality, your Bible may give an answer to what that is. Some say badger skins, porpoise skins, and such. In actuality, we do not know what, what type of animal provided these, these skins. And then verse 34 ends with this parochet, that veil of separation. That was the veil of the screen. Again, I say separation because this is the third time I'll say it. 
because it's separated between the holy place and the most holy place. This is the veil, the parochet that was, was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and we learned that it was a thick structure. It was torn when Messiah gave up his spirit, when he died upon that, that tree. Let's move now to verse 35. In the, the most holy place, we see, verse 35, the Ark of Testimony and its poles and the caport. Now, the caport is that mercy seat, that solid gold lid to the Ark of the Covenant that, that had at each side, each end, these cruvine, these cherubim, and we talked extensively over that, that Ark of the Covenant during the, the weeks and months that we've studied this tabernacle. So the Ark of Testimony with its poles, that's where we, we inserted them in order to carry them. And the, the lid, that mercy seat, verse 36. Now it moves into the holy place. The Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. We've learned that several times. But the, the showbread, the table of showbread was in the holy place. Not the most holy place, but the holy place. Verse 36. The table and all of its vessels, and we've learned that those vessels, they had like spoons. They had these shelves that the, the showbread was upon and also that structure. That, that allowed, they were like shelving units that allowed you to put one loaf above another. There was two sides with six levels that, that comprised this table of showbread, and that's what it speaks of concerning these vessels. And the vessels that would remove the bread from the oven and place them upon these shelves properly. Verse, verse 36 again the table and all of its vessels and the showbread. Verse 37. Also the menorah. And it says here, ha menorah, ha Torah. Ha Torah, this is the pure menorah. And some scholars say the reason why it's called pure is because the purpose of the menorah was to reveal God's presence a holy, a pure God, his presence among the people. So the pure menorah and its lights, we know that there was seven places for lights to eliminate, uh, illuminate. So it's, it's lights and the lights of its system, ha maracha. The order is another way that it might be translated. And all of its vessels, and finally, look at the end of verse 37. Shem and ha ma'or, the, the oil for illumination. Verse 38. Now we're going to be dealing with the incense altar. It was gold as well, acacia wood covered with gold, it says. And the, the altar, the golden altar, and also the anointing oil, and the incense spices and the screen of the entrance into the tent. And this tent is that inner tent that comprise of the main part, that holy place and the most holy place of the tabernacle. Verse 39. Verse 39. We've seen the last thing in verse 38 was that screen. That was the entrance. Now we're outside the tabernacle in the courtyard area. And there we see that there was another altar, the bronze or, or copper or brass altar. It was outside for the burnt offerings. It says the altar of Nehoshek, this, this brass, and also the, the grating that would allow things to be burnt up on it. It also was, was brass or copper, which was to it. 
And it had poles, its poles, and all of its vessels, and including the kior, that is that basin for washing, and the base that was the foundation of the kior of this, this place for washing this, this basin. Verse 40. Also, we know that this courtyard was surrounded like a fence, and these fence had hangings, and that's what we're talking about. That which was the, the screens, the hangings that were on the poles in order to separate, mark this, this place of worship. So verse 30, verse 40, excuse me, the hangings of the courtyard, and these hangings were attached to the pillars, so also its pillars and its sockets where the pillars were placed into, and also the screen, the screen for the gate of the courtyard, also its cords because these pillars were, were, were held in place, given stability, not just by the sockets they were placed in, but also these, these curtains or hangings were, were attached by cords, and also these cords were placed in the ground by these plagues, these pegs, excuse me, these pegs, and we read all the vessels for the work of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. So here we come to an end, going through approximately, and I've counted it, and depending upon certain uh, variants, we come up with, believe it or not, right around 33, you'll have to count yourself as well, but around 33 vessels that were mentioned in this, this first section up to the end of verse 40. Now, in verse 41, we're going to see the, the vessels or the garments of the high priest and the priest. So let's read that, verse 41. And the garments of the office. Remember, last week or the week before, we talked about this word, sarad. You make it a noun by the word misrad, office. So this is the priestly office. So all, we see here in verse 41, the vessels of the office, the priestly office, for serving in the holy place. And the vessels, the holy vessels that were for Aaron, the priest, and also the vessels or the garments, excuse me, the garments of his sons to serve. Now, it's important because we see two different words here. When we speak about Aharon, the high priest, it's the word lesharet, to serve. But when we look at the sons of Aaron, the typical priest, not the high priest, but all the other priests, it's not the word lesharet. But if you look here, it is the word at the end, it says, lekahen. And this is to minister. It's a word of service as well, but a synonym for Lesharet. And it's where we get the word Kohen, which means priest. But literally, a Kohen is one who serves. He has the role of that office to carry it out. Verse 42. Again, we find that, that same expression. This is the ninth time in chapter 39 that it's mentioned. According to all which... The Lord commanded Moses, thus they did. Who did? The children of Israel. They did all the work. Now, the word here for work is ha-avodah. The word avodah can mean work, but it's also a word that can be translated for service or worship as well. So we could read this, and let's do it in that fashion. Look again at verse 42. According to all which the Lord commanded Moses, thus the children of Israel did all the work. And the work relates to worship. Now look at verse 43. Now in verse 43, which is our final verse this evening, I want to say something. 
And that is, there is a very significant ending. And that ending provides very important revelation. If, if I were to ask you, do you want to be blessed by God? Obviously, every believer would say, yes, I want God's blessings in my life. That is the motivation for entering into a covenant to ultimately experience these eternal blessings, what's known as kingdom blessings. But notice how this chapter ends. We read in verse 43, And Moses, he saw all the labor. Now, at the end of verse 42, the last phrase is, Koha Aboda, all the work, but it can mean all the worship. Ha Aboda. But here we have a different word, Ha Melacha. Melacha, it's a word for work as well, but it's oftentimes translated labor. And what we find here is, Melacha, people do not do on Shabbat. But Aboda, worship, you can do. On Shabbat. Verse 43. And Moses saw all the malacha, all the labor. Vehine and behold. Now, I hope each of you, if you've been listening for, for a couple weeks even, you know the significance that I put upon that Hebrew word, hine, and also its Greek counterpart, idu, in the New Testament. It simply is behold, and it's a word that demands, commands you to pay attention. And the reason for God wanting you to pay attention is not for his benefit. He needs nothing. God is whole. God is perfect. God's complete. You don't add anything unto God. You can't subtract anything from him. He is always God, and he's always perfect, complete. But what we find here is that we need to be blessed. We need God's influence into our life. Look at verse 43. And behold, they did. Here again, B'nai Israel, that's the implication from the previous verse, verse 42. And they did it. What did they do? It. What's it? All, just as. The Lord commanded. Thus they did. Now, this is the third time we see that. We see it in verse 42, can asu, thus they did. Then we see in verse 43, behine asu, behold, they did. And then at the end of that second to last phrase in verse 43, ka tziva Hashem, can asu. Just as the Lord commanded, thus they did. And because they did, what was the outcome? Look how this chapter ends. Vaivarech otam Moshe. And Moses, he blessed them. And this blessing that Moses placed upon them didn't originate with Moses. But Moses, he having instructed them, what did he instruct them in? The words of the Lord, the commandments of God. And as they were sensitive and obedient to carry out the instructions, the commandments of God given to them by Moses, Moses, he brought upon them blessing. And this is what a godly inspired, a godly instructed worship does. Worship brings change whereby God will bless us. Now, it's very important that we see this principle. In my mind, it's the most important thing that we've learned tonight. And that is worship brings change. It positions us, it changes us so that we can be a recipient of God's blessing. Now, in Judaism, one of the ways that God is referred to is the blessed God. We say, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, 
king of the universe. You're the sovereign. Therefore, God's able to bless. But God looks, he examines everyone. I want to say that again. God examines everyone. And there are those that are in a, a spiritual position where God will not. Their condition causes God to refuse to bless them. And perhaps he will curse them. But if we are changed by worship, having done thus according to what he has commanded us, then that obedience will place us in a location, in a condition, which will bestow upon us, God will examine, and God will be moved, and he will bless. And this is what true faithfulness is, to act, behave in a way that brings about, that when God examines that he is moved to bless, that's what he wants to do. He's seeking who he can bless. Be one of those persons. And through being a recipient of God's blessing, it puts you in a position where you're better able now to even bless others. And that's where the joy comes in. Having been blessed by God, I can't be like him. And now do my own blessing through his provision. All the glory goes to him. But now I become like him in behavior. See, we don't become like the false New Age movement teaches. We don't become little gods. But we are called to be big servants who behave like him. We do not become gods, but we think like God thinks because he gives us his mind. And he gives us his power, his perspective, so that we can carry out his work. This is what being a disciple of Messiah Yeshua is all about. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>